By the way, John, Robbie and I got a movie coming out called Body Slam with Tanya Roberts and Dirk Benedict. It'll be released shortly. It's a Helmdale production. Great. Thanks for reminding me about another movie I need to review. inevitable. The year was 1986. Professional wrestling was all the rage thanks to Hulk Hogan and the WWF, so it was only natural that the film industry capitalized on this wrestling mania. Well, you come up with a better name for it. The result was Body Slam, a movie starring the A-Team's Dirk Benedict, Roddy Piper, Captain Lou Albano, and a host of other wrestling stars. It's a tale of a music agent turned wrestling manager who recruits a pair of grapplers and brings them to the top thanks to a totally radical new combination of wrestling and rock music. Gosh, I wonder where they got that idea. But for as many cool key players and cameos this movie has, it's hampered by a terrible story, terrible acting, terrible sound, terrible music. Uh, you know what, just think of anything having to do with a movie, put the word terrible in front of it, and you'll get the idea. But hey, who am I to complain? Makes it easy for me to find material. So without any further ado, let's dive right into Body Slam. Benedict plays M. Harry Smilak, a once prominent music agent in Los Angeles whose career has hit the skids. And we know all of this thanks to about 10 seconds of exposition. For a while, you had the Midas touch. I mean, your acts were winning Grammys. People really Why? liked you. But lately, excuse my French, everything you handle turns to caca. Oh, ho, ho, watch that mouth, you! Not only is Harry's luck as a successful agent run out, but we learn that he's also incurred a lot of debt after we meet this lovely ethnic stereotype. Mr. Smilek? I'm Mr. Kim from the Pusan Savings and Loan of Vice President. Corrections. Corrections? I correct money from deadbeats like you. You owe us considerable sum. Harry tries to talk his way out of the debt, but the wild Samoans enter and total Harry's car to make a statement. Later on, while trying to gather musical acts for an upcoming event, he walks in on negotiations with Roddy Piper, who's been given the NXT name of Quick Rick Roberts for this movie. Roberts has a niece named Missy, who goes everywhere with him. It's never explained what happened to Missy's parents, or why Roberts is her guardian. In fact, there isn't much to this girl at all. She has no memorable dialogue and does absolutely nothing to advance the plot. Just a complete waste of space in this movie. Maybe she'd be more useful if you gave her a computer watch and a dog for a sidekick. Anyway, Smilak mistakes Roberts for a musician and takes him on as his manager. And that's where the wackiness begins! Roberts! We're introduced to Roberts' previous manager, Captain Lou Morano, played by Captain Lou Albano. Wow, way to get creative with that name, guys. You think you're leaving me? Captain Lou Morano, the man who made you? I took you out of nowhere! <laughs> Gee, you can already tell this role's gonna be a stretch for Albano. <laughs> Zane! Oh no. It's me! I'm Captain Lou, and I'm talking to you! How dare you insult the Captain in his finest film role! Well, Captain, no offense or anything, but I mean, at least Roddy Piper is trying to convey a different character than what he usually does in wrestling, and meanwhile, you're just... you! And it doesn't look like you're getting all your lines right the first time. They dub you over a few times. You're kidding. You're kidding. You're kidding. Yeah, 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 well maybe if that lousy director didn't have the brain of a dehydrated BB and keep me from improvising, here's what I was trying to say! I'm starving. You see right there? I was trying to improvise, I was trying to feel the scene, I'm like a regular Brando! You were just hungry and lost your concentration for a second, didn't you? Maybe. Harry also manages to recruit Tonga Tom, played by the Tonga Kid. While this is going on, Quick Rick is confronted and threatened by two more of Captain Lou's heavies, the Cannibals, played by the Barbarian and Tejo Khan. I've got a new manager now. I've got somebody else doing the talking for me. And you know the best part about it is, I don't have to be around wonderful human beings like yourself. <laughs> Axe, can you believe it? Three sentences in a row. Hey, you learned how to count. 
Roberts and Tonga Tom are made into a tag team and they quickly rise up the ranks after one match, apparently. As momentum builds, Harry comes on as a guest on Ring Talk, which is billed as the number one talk show on television. And boy, with its universal subject matter, quality production, and that awesome, diverse crowd, why wouldn't it be? Now, the effect! Welcome, wrestling fans. Thank you. <laughs> hey, it's Charles Nelson Riley. Charles Nelson Riley was a mighty man, the, the kind of man you'd never disrespect. He stood eight foot tall, wore glasses, and he had a third nipple on the back of his neck. I feel kind of bad for Riley in this film. He doesn't need to be bogged down by being affiliated with this crap. Then again, it's not quite his most embarrassing role. Oh, you bundling eight balls! <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back later and rock you up! <laughs> this whole scene is notable for two things. One, it advances the feud between Harry and Captain Lou Morano. Morano represents the old guard who doesn't take too kindly to new managers coming in and ruffling feathers. Two, it gives us legendary character actor Billy Barty at his finest. He's an idiot! He's a tiger! Yeah! That word is the bulk of Barty's dialogue throughout this entire movie. Also, is it me or is Captain Lou looking down at cue cards or something between each sentence here? Everybody knows these musical thoughts are into all sorts of strange stuff. Really? They don't belong in a red-blooded all-American sport like wrestling. We don't need wimps and funny-looking clothes telling us how to run our business. Hey, hey, let's see if you can memorize your lines when you're in the presence of the one and only CNR. Oh, by the way, I should mention that by this point, Harry's trying to woo a young woman he meets earlier in the film. Not that it matters, since there's absolutely no chemistry between the two of them, and that Tanya Roberts' character contributes exactly nothing to the plot. Again, another completely pointless character. Yes, I too have noticed that the most useless characters in this movie are women, and no, I don't think that's a coincidence. The two of them make it back to Harry's house when... Oh, Mr. Smartak, Mr. Smartak, we meet again. We're treated once again to not Mr. Fuji and the Wild Samoans. Are they just living in that shed now? That's my mother's car! Oh my God! You know, Mr. Kim's actually pretty lenient for a loan shark. I would think that anyone else in his position would have cut off a finger or a toe by now. Things go from bad to worse for Harry. The political event he was organizing music for fails spectacularly, forcing him to hide from organizers while wearing a dress. Then, Captain Lou and the Cannibals get the jump on Quick Rick and Tonga Tom by being named last-minute replacements in a match. Oh, <laughs> uh, is there a point to hearing the Captain mumble so much during this match? Because that's what the people paid to see. They came to this movie to see the Captain Lou in his natural state, a mentally unstable Guido Santa Claus. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some more rubber bands to procure. Look at the kid's face. Do you think that was the face that Piper made when he found out he was going to job to Mr. America? So Tom, Rick, and Harry... No. No, they couldn't be that clever. They all take a severe pounding at the hands of the dastardly heels, which the fans seem to be okay with for some reason. In the hospital, Harry has a heart-to-heart -heart with the guys. I let you down. I blew it. Ah, oh, Harry, go on. It wasn't your fault. Don't worry, Harry. We'll get him next time. Wow, these guys seem to be in pretty good spirits after almost getting killed in the ring. Maybe they're Bo Leavers? Don't stop believing! It doesn't feel too good having people I like get hurt on my account. So I'm going to abandon you in your hour of need. Bye! Roberts, undeterred, pleads with Harry to get back into wrestling. Thought I told you to get somebody else. Harry, you're my man. I don't want nobody else. You're the best. Hold up a minute. I, I have a serious question that I, I need someone to explain for me. Why is Piper's character so loyal to Harry. The two of them met when Harry just BS'd his way into a meeting that Roberts was involved in. Hell, Smiley didn't even realize that Roberts was a wrestler before getting into a business he knew nothing about. If this film is showing us, the audience, everything, then Smiley had only booked two matches for his guys up to this point, and they totally got their asses handed to them in one of them. How's that for customer satisfaction? 
Harry can't get his guys booked in larger arenas because Morano has blacklisted him, so he decides to take his wrestlers and his rock band on the road, hitting up smaller venues. Everything is going great until... Elmo, you can't do this to me. I've got posters up all over town advertising two different shows on two different nights. Wait, wait, wait. Two different shows? Two different nights? Wait a minute. You're just now combining the two? Sure enough, the impromptu combination of rock music and wrestling go together like peanut butter and jelly, and their hybrid show is a hit. Which makes you wonder, why didn't they do that in the first place? Like, I'm not crazy, right? You all thought that's what was going to happen too, right? How is that not Smilak's first idea? Isn't combining the two acts into one show more cost-effective than running two entirely separate shows? No wonder this guy was a crap agent. Harry's rock and wrestling tours the country and is hailed as being revolutionary. This despite the fact the World Wrestling Federation had already started the rock and wrestling connection two years before this movie took place. But hey, never let facts get in the way of a good story. Smilak and his guys return to LA with a lot of momentum and goad Captain Lou into a grudge match between the two tag teams with titles and careers on the line. All the stars are here to see this fight, including some of the greatest cameos a wrestling movie's ever seen. Classy Freddy Blassie, Sheik Adnan El Kassi, Bruno San Martino, and Ric Flair. Or, uh, Ric Flair? Seriously, how hard is it to get that guy's name spelled in a movie? But before the main event, which is the only match on this card for some reason, we get... A song break! Oh yeah! Rocky, get down! Oh look, even Bruno's feeling it! All right! Alright man, this is what rock and wrestling's all about! Hang on a second. Alright, so there's a side plot in the film about Harry and his involvement in a political event that I haven't discussed much, but I'm going back to it for one reason. At that event, the rock band that Harry books has tons of pyro, but here we are at a wrestling show, and this same band has not one ounce of pyro! Wouldn't this be a perfect place and time to bust that stuff out? In the middle of the number, Morano and the cannibals break in and total the equipment, which gets the audience members wallowing in as much sadness as people did when Edge retired. So to review, wrestlers being beaten to a pulp, smiles all around, but break a guitar, break some hearts. Get out of the ring, Lou! Whoa, calm down, former WWF referee Jesse Hernandez, what did Bruno ever do to you? This somehow causes a riot throughout the entire crowd, but Quick Rick and Tonga Tom save the day in their shiny capes, and the match is on. Did Tonga Tom just soil himself? Things are looking grim for the good guys until they mount a miraculous comeback. Then someone in the editing room stops the tape of the commentary track as the hot tag commences. And Rick, he's got to touch Rick because Rick's got to be on the fight, and he does get to him. No after a thrilling bout, Quick Rick and Tonga Tom win the match. Quick Rick makes a pterodactyl noise. The boys grab their cardboard belts and the credits roll. Ugh. That movie was hard to get through, guys. Body Slam doesn't necessarily make wrestling or the people in it look bad, in my opinion. It doesn't expose the business or make fans look like idiots. It's just a really dumb film. It's poorly acted, poorly written, poorly edited, just plain poor all around. Anything and anyone not related to Harry and the wrestlers is totally flimsy, especially Piper's niece and Harry's love interest. Talk about some of the biggest wastes of space in a movie I've ever seen. They don't even need to be saved or anything, which, you know, it's not the greatest role for a female, but it'd be more than what they were given here. And another thing, how dumb did the filmmakers think that moviegoers would be to see this movie and think that rock and wrestling, this combination, was concocted spur of the moment by some manager? That is how it happened! I was the one who got my good friend Cindy Lauper into the WWF! I'm the one who started the Rock and Wrestling Connection, baby! This movie's my life story! Oh, hey, while you're here, I was gonna ask you something. The night of the big fight, why were you parking in the handicapped space? I am handicapped! I'm psychotic! <laughs> well, no argument here. Smilak is dead. Smilak is dead. He tricked the Wild Samoas into totally my car. He pulled a fast one of my boys and stole the Tag Team Championships! Smilak is dead! Smilak is dead! Hang on, hang on. First of all, Harry Smilak's a fictional character. That stuff with you and him didn't really happen. Second of all, aren't you dead? Oh, um, uh... Everybody, do the Mario! Swing your arms from side to side. You're not getting
getting out of this that easy, Captain Lou. Curse you, Zane! Huh. Well, that was weird. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time! And from that moment forward, it would be known as the worst Captain Lou Albano impression in history. The end. Curse you, Zay! <laughs>